Hi, I'm Mark Maggioli, and welcome back to another reading of Boston Accent. Boston Accent is available on Amazon.com, and it contains mature subject matter. And we're going to pick up where we left off. Let's do it. <clears throat> For our Labor Day weekend, I transferred out of the, con out of the uh, convention center, the old CC, into the showroom as a busman. This was the required entry position to take before a waiter position, which is one of the highest paying positions in the casino. The showroom had headliners from legends like Wayne Newton to Don Rickles. There were two shows a night, seven days a week. The first show was a dinner show, and the second was strictly cocktails. My goal was to make waiter in the showroom and then get on the list for the CC where the biggest money was made. When I left the CC, Joel threw a party for me at his house. One of the people attending the party was my replacement in the CC. His name was Troy Pepper, and he was a couple of years younger than me. He looked like a big old farm boy from Iowa. Truth be told, he was native of California. We were introduced at the party, but did not make any attempt to get to know each other. He came across to me as big and stupid, and I had no desire to waste my time on him. Instead, I devoted all my attention to a beautiful blonde at the party. Joel was dating a girl from the laundry room at, the, at Club Tahoe by the name of Liz, and the blonde, Jade, was her sister. Jade was stunning, easy to talk to, and she wanted to know everything about me. We're sitting on the couch together talking up a storm when I noticed we're getting a lot of attention. There were several guys at the party that I didn't know that Joel had invited, and they were giving me the hairy eyeball because of my close proximity to Jade. Snooze you lose, I'm thinking, as I went, went on talking to Jade while she drank in every word I said while looking deep into my eyes. All of a sudden, I hear a song being played real loud, and I recognize it as Joe Jackson's, Is she really going out with him? And as the chorus kicks in, all the guys that have been giving me dirty looks start singing the lyrics. I laugh it off as a clever attack, but Jade became uncomfortable with these jerks staring at us and ended up leaving with Liz. It was a long time before I saw her again. After Jade left, I found myself talking sports, as I often did. In the middle of my conversation with someone, Troy yells, Boston sucks, from across the room. I just met him, and we had yet to even speak to each other after our introductions. So I had to take a long look at him to try to figure out if he was trying to be funny or if he wanted to fight. The expression on his face told me he wasn't trying to make a joke. He had a personal problem with me. The house had become dead silent. All eyes were on me as they waited to see what I would do. I sat down my beer, took a couple of steps towards Troy and said, I fucked your mother in the ass and she squealed like a pig. It was still silent in the room, with all eyes shifted to Troy to see what he would do. He did nothing. He stared at me. Joel came over, whispered in his ear, and Troy sat down, glaring at me. I walked back over to the person I'd been talking to, and we resumed our conversation. I stood so I'd keep my eye on Troy, but my body, by my body language sent a message that he was no threat. Later that night, when we were the only, there was only four people left in the room, including myself, Troy, who was passed out in the chair, Joel's brother Bobby, and a friend of his. I decided to send a message to, to Troy that he had started shit with the wrong person. First, I tied his shoelaces together so that when he stood up, he would fall on his face. Next, I went into the kitchen and grabbed some barbecue sauce, which I dumped all over his head. Last but not least, I took a can of gray primer that I found in the garage. I opened up his shirt and pants. I spray painted his nipples, and I made a racing stripe from his throat to his crotch. As soon as I finished, he woke up and tried to stand. When he spotted his shoes tied together, he pulled out a knife he had, and he cut the laces. He sat in the chair with a knife in his hand, staring at the three of us. Bobby and his friend went quickly to the sliders at the back, back of the room and left the house. Troy continued to sit in the chair holding the knife and staring at me. 
I calmly walked past him and out the front door without saying a word. Troy ended up hitchhiking home, and he couldn't understand why no one would stop until he got home, looked in the mirror, and saw a big clump of orange barbecue sauce in his hair. He didn't see the primer until he was in the shower, and then he knew someone had seriously fucked with him. He never got me back, but I was looking over my shoulder for a long time. One afternoon, not too long after the Troy barbecue sauce incident, I was hanging out at Joel's with Joel's brother Bobby and Frank. Joel had gone to the casino to pick up Liz at the end of her shift and bring her back here. We heard Joel pull up in the driveway, and then Riz, Liz ran in the house all upset and said, Nino, Joel needs you outside. We all got up and walked outside to see Joel sitting on the ground while a, while a cowboy-looking dude threw punches at his head. Two other cowboys were on the front lawn watching, and when they saw us, us, us come out, they backed up and said, Let it go, it's a fair fight. Up to this point in my life, I've had a reputation of being the first one to jump in at the chance to fight, but not today. We had just got stoned, and I was feeling nothing but mellow. The last thing I wanted to do was start swinging on three guys for reasons that had nothing to do with me. I evaluated the Joel situation, and although he was on the losing end, the only thing really getting damaged was his ego. Joel had a reputation for starting fights with his big mouth, but not being able to back it up, and this was on my mind as well. Frank made no move to jump in, and I did not expect him to. Frank was not a fighter, and was about as laid back as you can get. Behind me, I heard Joel's brother Bobby yell, I'm getting the gun. The two cowboys that had been watching yelled to their friend, Gun, as they ran for their truck. The fighting, fighting cowboy tried to get in a couple more licks before running to join his, his friends, but his punches were all in on Joel's arms that were raised over his head. Bobby ran out out onto the lawn with, a, with an unloaded rifle, and I threw a perfectly good beer at the cowboy's truck. Missed. Just for good measure. Joel got up off the ground and was mad at everyone for not jumping in, but mostly he was mad at me. In his mind, I was obligated to jump in and fight with him side by side as needed. In his mind, fighting was something that came natural to me. In my mind, I would choose who and when I fought, and Joel probably deserved it. Turns out Joel started the fight with the Cowboys during a road rage incident, and not only did he start the confrontation in the casino parking lot, but he told the Cowboys to follow him home. His intention was to involve us without us having any say. I felt a little bad for us not jumping in, but overall I was comfortable with my decision to let Joel take his own lumps for once. A couple of weeks later, Phil came to visit me from Sacramento. He decided to move back to Boston. He wanted to say goodbye before he started his cross-country trip in his 64 Mercury. I had been working the show for about two, two weeks now, and I hated everything about it. I had to work that night, which was a Saturday, our busiest night of the week, and I had been drinking and smoking all day with Phil. I decided I was too high to go in, and I called in sick. The person you called in sick to when you were a busman was the head busman. The head busman was a guy named Roberto, who was originally from somewhere in Central America. He had a real strong accent and was wound way too tight. This guy was so hyper and stressed out 24-7 that I hated to work with him. I made the call, and he picked up. When I told him I wasn't coming in, he flipped out and started screaming at me that I had to come in because it was Saturday night, and we were already shorthanded. I repeated that I would not be in, and, and he wanted to argue about it, so I said, you know what? Fuck you. Stick the job up your ass. I'm not coming back. I hung up and looked at Phil, who had been sitting across the room from me listening, and he said, what did you just do? I shrugged and said, I think I just quit my job. Do you have room in your car for me to go to Boston? Phil said, I have room for you, but I don't have room for any of your stuff. I thought for a minute and said, I have one suitcase, and that's it. Anything else, I'll mail or leave here. Phil spent the night, and early the next morning, I made hurried goodbyes to my shocked roommates as I moved out with no notice. I said nothing to my friends. They would hear through the grapevine that I was gone. Phil and I drove straight to Sacramento without stopping. He wanted to get his car packed and us on the road, headed east in 24 hours. 
I always said I was spontaneous, but this might not be the best judgment I ever exercised. Okay, that's another segment. We're going to stop right there, and we'll pick it up in a little while and do another one. We're playing catch up because you can probably tell I've been sick. I'm still very congested, but I, I don't want to fall too, too far behind on this. I know that there, I do have people that read this every day, read, watch. So we're going to make an attempt to, uh, to get something done on this. All right, I'm Mark Mattioli. We're reading Boston Accent. It's available on Amazon.com. Ciao.